So, hey, I'm going to be talking about the quest for the best tests today. Uh, we're going to look at all the different testing tools that we used, and I'm going to be talking about the bugs that we didn't find on mainnet. If you were here for two talks before mine, um, Mario spoke about the bugs that we did find, so I'm going to do the contra. Um, the first part, let's talk about what we're actually doing with testing. Why is the merge complicated to begin with? Well. We have roughly 20 different client combinations, and regressions sneak in very easily. You might see a regression in one of the client combinations, but none of the other ones, and that's very tricky to pinpoint. Uh, the specs were in active development. There were quite a few of the early test nets where we kind of didn't pin the spec version. So someone was uh, implementing something on a different commit, so of course the test net broke. So we had to actually figure out how to treat modifying specs along with modifying test nets, along with 20 t different combinations all changing at the same time. Um, communicating and debugging, it's great that we have a decentralized environment. It's horrible if I have to wait for the Australians to wake up for anything. Um, it does take quite a bit of effort and quite a bit of planning on our side. We had to kind of schedule around people picking up their kids from school. We had to schedule around people waking up in Australia. We had to schedule around Americans, a lot of different things. And figuring out how to do all of this in a reliable manner and on a timeline was crazy. Um, the last one was debug knowledge. We were really surprised the type of debugging you need to do for CLs and ELs are totally different. We had to see how to bring all of that competence in one place and how to actually figure out when something goes wrong. And they did go wrong a lot in the beginning. Um, and the nice part is if you figure this out once, we figured it out for future test nets. So happy that that worked out. What could possibly go wrong? So the merge has two parts, the consensus layer and the execution layer. And they communicate via this thing called the engine API. So if we mess up the consensus layer, you're going to have a network that can't agree on anything. If you mess up the execution layer, you have a network that can't do anything. So those are the two high level problems that we're in trying to ensure that never happen. Um, just to enumerate a bit from the regular testing world, what sort of tests even exist? So we have unit tests, and at least in our decentralized uh, world with all the client teams, the client teams take care of this themselves. We don't have to do anything, no coordination work from our side. Uh, this makes sure that there's no regression, but these are localized regressions, something that they might have seen on their client based on how they've built their client. Um, we have integration tests. Part of them are done by client teams. So for example, the Nimbus team spins up a local Nimbus network to make sure that their stuff can always talk to each other. Um, then on a high level, we do some interop tests. So these might be dev nets or whatever they are. Then we have system tests. And this is where external coordinators come in. So I'm going to say the EF was part of the external coordinator for the testing efforts. So these test end-to-end -end functionality. We spin up a test net, we run transactions, we um, withdraw, we set up faucets, we look at if explorers work, and so on. And then we have production tests. This is something you guys might have seen with ShadowFox. So production tests sort of work on a prod-like environment. And I'll go into what ShadowFox are later on, but on a high level, we inherit all the complexity of mainnet. And this also includes public test nets. So if you guys remember Kiln or Kintsugi, that falls under this bucket. So you have everyone all over the place testing their things. Layer twos are deploying over there. We have random DeFi protocols de are deploying over there. And these find issues that only happen on real work workloads. You probably can't simulate them any other way. So the second part, I'm going to talk about what different tools we had and just give you a brief overview. And just to tell you how this is going to go, once you have an overview of what sort of testing tools we have, I'm going to talk about what we actually did with them and what we didn't find. So the first one, uh, starting at a high level, we have spec tests. It's the great thing about the consensus layer. They have an executable spec. They have specifications with a ton of tests. Client teams can then import these specs and make sure that they can test them in their local CI. This means whenever they're making a release, at least you know that they're coherent to the spec. 
Uh, this is largely a sanity check. It's not meant to find any massive bug, but it ensures that there's no regressions happening. We currently have the spec tests, I think, running every night on, uh, on a new CI machine. The second one is Hive tests. You might have seen this being referenced a couple of times. Um, so Hive tests run with a simulator, and they essentially start up the clients and then run the tests against a predefined interface. These are a couple hundred tests. These take anywhere between, I think, a day or two days to run everything. Um, and a brief example of how this is, is it starts up a tiny instance of a nethermind node. It sends it two terminal blocks and asserts how the transition happens. Uh, this is a lot of awesome work by Mario. He should be somewhere in the crowd. Um, shout out to him and follow him on Twitter. Uh, we found a lot of edge cases in this. And once we do find an edge case, it's always in there so that we make sure uh, in, in future updates, whatever, it doesn't happen um, if people check the website, of course. Then we have this thing called Kurtosis. It's an external tool that we're working with, and Kurtosis obfuscates all the complexity with setting up a testnet. You don't have to worry about how Genesis works. You don't have to worry what format that nethermind needs its Genesis file in, nothing. You just define it in a YAML file. You say, I want a five node network with this Docker image, and that's what happens for you. Um, we ran this actually nightly, and I think we've gone through the merge at least a couple hundred times this year. Um, a lot of them with issues, but a lot of them without, which is great to see. Uh, we use this also to rapidly iterate ideas. So once there's a new spec version, or if you want to try out a new testing tool, we throw it in there first. We also had MevBoost integrated into Kurtosis so we could test it out and do a lot of cool things there. Um, a general view of Kurtosis is it, it checks the happy case. If you can't figure out the happy case, there's no point checking it, the rest of it. So it just starts up a testnet, make sure everything is fine, if it's fine, it shows you green on your CI. The next one is sync tests. Um, there's no point on a network if you have nodes that can't sync up to the network. So what we do is we spin up uh, nodes, I think, at a week's notice right now. Um, they sync up to the head of the chain. And then they assert whatever we specify over there. So if you notice over here, you can say, is execution healthy? Is consensus healthy? Are both synced? Are they both uh, reaching head? So you can kind of define what side, type of syncing you want to do here. Um, and as you can see on the right, there are a ton of different options you can do and a ton of networks. And the cool thing is you can also assert bad cases. You can say, start your EL, stop once it reaches head, then start your CL, and then build weird scenarios there. Um, shout out to Sam for building this. He was also running it and sending a summary. Um, I think he even presented it once on Olco Devs. Um, so we could make sure that at least when we're making releases and when we merge, that we can sync the network. And this is the meaty one. We had testnets and shadow forks. So a shadow fork and testnet help us coordinate all client teams in one place, and we check compatibility largely. We take whatever assumptions we have in the spec, and we assert if those assumptions are true. On a large level, what we're doing is we're taking the genesis configuration of any one network, and then we modify a couple of values here and there. And what happens when those modified values are hit is we split away from the main network, but we continue staying synced, uh, connected on the gossip network. So we're importing all the transactions, and we have the old load, but it's on a side. We, it's, it's just a side fork. Um, it runs parallel to the main network, and no one cares about it, uh, except for us, because we can find dozens and dozens of bugs there. Um, this allows us to stress all of our assumptions. And we've done a lot of them. I have a summary on how many we actually did in the end. Um, I sort of look at this as a release test. So it's kind of one of the last things we would do on any of the future forks that we have. It's kind of when we're almost figuring out, are we ready to go ahead with this? Are we ready to move forward with, with committing to this fork? Are, is there any unknowns that we don't know yet? And then we have fuzzers and an external organization called Antithesis. So Antithesis is a, is a deterministic hypervisor that allows us to perform network splits, packet loss, all sorts of really weird edge cases. We don't necessarily expect the network to be put in these edge cases, 
but if they are, we know that the clients can handle it. Um, on the right side, you, you can't even actually see it, but each of those is a 256 thread machine. We have three of them, all running fuzzers. It was insane, we had way more. Uh, I've never seen that much compute in my life. We actually had um, the IBM data center go out and buy more CPUs because we bought up all of them. Um, yeah, various fuzzers, various teams running out all of them. Uh, super cool, we found a ton of bugs. Refer to Marius's talk if you want to know what we actually found there. And we hope that some of those bugs change the spec to make it a lot more stable, or sometimes an implementation issue. So to give you a brief idea on the testing lifecycle, um, let me tell you it's never that clean, uh, but that's what we want to hope to achieve. So you have the client releases happening, and once the client releases happen, they go into the integration tests. So we make sure that test nets can be run, that integration tests work fine. And once that's done, we move on to uh, test nets, and then we move on to stress tests, and we push whatever we find on these stress tests onto specifications, we do regression tests, and then we do fuzzing. And hopefully, whatever we find in the last couple of stages, go back into client releases. So that's an kind of a nice way to look at a full life cycle of how testing would work. We're hoping to adopt the same life cycle for future test nets. Maybe we moved around a tool here or there, but that's the general idea. And the end game, what did we actually do? Um, it was really hard to find a graph that actually fit all the test nets we had. That's how many. Um, so we had we started off in April of 2021 with Rayanism, and since then we've had four public test nets that anyone could permissionlessly join into. We had six dev nets meant for all the client teams. We had um, five Gully Shadow Fox, and in the end, 13 Mainnet Shadow Fox. And after all of this, we had three test net Fox, and only then did we hit Mainnet. Um, so the whole number of just testing hours in the merge is insane. I'm quite sure if we added it all up, it would be at least a couple 10,000 hours put into this. Um, so what didn't we find? Um, this is a really interesting part, because even though we have all of these cool tools, there's still always going to be something we didn't find. This 99% participation, 98% participation, or great blocks being produced, awesome. But I want to know what we still didn't find. So first one. Um, we had in-memory databases that were too low to process mainnet blocks. It just so happened that we did too good a job of deciding which uh, machines run our test nets, which means we didn't have any resource constraints. And we kind of missed the people running nodes on 8 gig RAM machines or people running on 16 gig RAM machines. We didn't account for that or we didn't account for older versions of RAM being used, whatever it is. Um, another one that we missed is non-optimal block production. Um, we were super focused on making sure that we didn't see any zero transaction blocks on the network. We didn't compare that to what the optimal blocks on the network could be. So it is an optimization problem, of course, and it is an awful that on mainnet we have some reduced load, but it is something we missed and something we probably should look into in the future. Um, the next one. There was a really specific way in which the terminal blocks could arrive that broke Nethermind. And it broke Nethermind by causing missing receipts, and we only noticed that issue when there are deposits being made. So we completely missed this, and for what we still yet to figure out why, but this is mainly an issue for Lodestar Nethermind and no other combination, or at least we didn't get the. Uh, memo from other breaking combinations. So Lodestar Nethermind figured that out on day one of the merge, and it, I think it was patched like a day later. Um, another one that we didn't think of, all of the shadow fox didn't have any nodes syncing up to the network after the shadow fork was done, which means they weren't serving sync data, and all they were doing were keeping up with the chain, which is great. But constantly syncing on mainnet also adds load on the machine. So we weren't accurately simulating that. So potentially on future Shadow Fox, we're going to have to add a bunch of syncing nodes that start up later on to see what could happen there. And the last one that we didn't find was a failover beacon node scenario. A lot of people are really obsessed with making sure they don't miss a single attestation, which means they have multiple beacon nodes set up. 
and that's something we just never did. So a lot of the requests were just being sent to the primary beacon node and not the backup. So when the failover happens, the backup wasn't ready. Um, I think this has also been patched right now, but it was a really tricky thing, and we should try more failover backup scenarios in the future, I guess. Um, one cool thing about why all of this wasn't found, most of them are optimization bugs. Um, as you can see, merge still went fine, but we could, there's still some room for improvement. And it's a really hard trade-off to make between do we want to spend more dev time in fixing these optimizations, or did we want an earlier merge? And that's kind of the tricky thing. Do we want earlier forks, or do we want completely bugless free, free, um, free forks? No idea. Uh, but we're definitely going to be adding resource-constrained uh, machines to the mix next time. We're thinking of just getting a bunch of Raspberry Pis and doing some shadow forks on there, see what happens there. And another reason some of the bugs appeared, uh, but they didn't appear on the shadow fox, is last minute commits. Um, the last shadow fox was, I think, a week before the merge, and the last releases also happened a few days before the merge. So, yeah, it's a hard trade off. Um, if you want to join the testing efforts, please join um, Mario Vega. Um, his email address is here, send in your information there. And I think I supposed to, okay, I was supposed to have one more slide, but I will just talk about that other slide over here. Um, so we have a bunch of testing tools that we've completely open sourced. If you're someone who wants to run test nets in Kubernetes, if you're someone who wants to just run Kubernetes nodes, if you want to set up your own networks, uh, we have easy ways to set up Genesis. If you want to, um, yeah, use the same stuff we use for ShadowFox, all of it is completely open source. Quite a few organizations are actually reusing our, um, our stuff, so shout out to them. Um, contribute back whenever you can. You can find most of the tools on um, either on the Ethereum GitHub repo or on the ETH Panda Ops GitHub repo, uh, one of the two. And yeah, that's about it. That's most of what we did and did not find on the merge. Um, um, thank you. <laughs>